Hello, and welcome to our first 2021 Ask the Expert videocast. Please join us every month as we interview experts on various topics, which will include tips for building your immune system to ways of getting involved with the foundation. Most importantly, the topics and questions are those that come from you and we want to hear from you. So please submit your suggestions for future topics through our info box, a link is provided below, or you can always call us at 610-667-0131. Today, our topic is COVID-19 vaccines and the GBS CIDP community. We are joined by Dr. Peter D'Onofrio, Chairman of our Global Medical Advisory Board, Professor of Neurology, Chief of the Neuromuscular Division and Vice Chairman of Compliance and Professionalism at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. So welcome, Dr. D'Onofrio. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. As I mentioned, to today here. our topic is vaccines and COVID-19. So to begin the conversation, can you explain the differences between the vaccines that are currently available? Well, firstly, the vaccine for COVID is a very unique uh, vaccine that is used for one of the first times in the history of medicine. So it's called an mRNA, so messenger RNA vaccine. Most vaccines are developed based upon the DNA in the nucleus of a cell. This vaccine is developed uh, based upon messenger RNA that is in the cytoplasm or the major part of the cell. And the vaccine will um, create antibodies against the uh, messenger RNA in COVID and will help block the infection. It's also important to realize that the MRI, mRNA vaccines, uh, that is the COVID vaccines, are extremely beneficial. So for instance, the two vaccines we have, Pfizer and Moderna, after two um, administrations confer 95% protection. That is almost unheard of. So the flu vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccines are 60, 70% effective, particularly the flu. So for both the vaccines for COVID to be 95% effective is just a marvel of medical science. Mm. So there are two vaccines now, Pfizer and Moderna. The Pfizer vaccine is given and repeated three weeks later. The Moderna vaccine is given and is repeated four weeks later. If you only receive one shot, your coverage is 80% against infection. With two shots, it's 95%. Mm. And do both of those uh, vaccines work the same way, the way you just described? Pretty much. I, there, there may be a slight difference in the mechanism of action, but um, if there is, I'm not aware of it. Okay. And I think, I think most people should realize that both vaccines are excellent. Both vaccines are of equal benefit and efficacy, and either one is fine. There's no reason to prefer one over the other. And would that apply to uh, the upcoming J&J &J or AstraZeneca vaccines that are on the horizon as well? Um, yes and no. So the, it's interesting, about two weeks ago, I heard that the J&J &J vaccine were going to be, that, that vaccine was going to be submitted to the FDA for an emergency use. Mm. And I haven't heard anything about it in the past week. Um, and then the AstraZeneca, I don't, I know even less about that. I understand they're not quite as beneficial. I think they're more in the 80% range the J&J um, &J only requires one injection. I don't know about the AstraZeneca. Um, there's, they're not quite as effective as the other two vaccines, but still excellent compared to the flu vaccine that we've all been getting each year. All right, that's important perspective to note, I think. 
So if somebody makes available to you Johnson Johnson or AstraZeneca, take it. <laughs> okay. I mean, particularly if you would have to wait a month or two for Pfizer or Moderna, there's no reason to wait because 80% protection is great and would actually confer herd immunity, which is what, which is a phrase I think that has been kicked around now for about a year. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what that would mean? So herd immunity is a concept that when about 70% of people either have received the vaccine or have contracted the natural infection and developed antibodies, that if 70% of people have the antibodies either from vaccine or natural infection, then your chances of running into a person who is not infected is so low that the disease essentially um, eliminates itself. Hmm. Now, I think most of us, particularly the vaccinologists and infectious disease people, they're aware of herd immunity, but they're not advocating it. In other words, don't stay home and not get the vaccination in hopes that by November, there will be enough herd immunity that you can walk out into society without your mask and hug everybody. Right. <laughs> okay, so let's dig in a little bit um, into how this pertains to the GBS and CIDP MMN patient community. Um, so these are all questions that we have heard through our community. Um, so the first one is, would I be considered pre-existing if I have had GBS in the past and does that allow me to get the vaccine any quicker? That's an excellent question that I don't know the answer to, but I suspect if you have had Guillain-Barre before, you could probably use that as a justification to move farther up the line for the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Because if they are letting people with heart failure, lung disease, and asthma uh, ahead of other people, I think a prior history of Guillain-Barre would justify it. And the reason for that is if you had Guillain-Barre you have some residual disease, particularly uh, diaphragm involvement and you're short of breath, you don't want to get the COVID vac uh, natural infection. Mm -hmm. And I think if somebody approached me, asked me for a letter to justify moving forward in the line, I would be happy to write it for a patient of mine. Hmm. And you know, what's interesting is we are hearing from some patients that have had Guillain-Barre that they're going to get the vaccine and they're being denied the vaccine because they have had Guillain-Barre. Yes, and I'm not surprised. And there's absolutely no justification or science behind that. The vaccine is, first of all, an entirely different concept than the vaccines that have used for the flu vaccine. And they're certainly much different than a natural infection. So um, I think if somebody is denied COVID vaccine because they've had Guillain-Barre in the past, they should challenge it or move on to another place where they can get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a situation where I think the person's neurologist who took care of them when they had Guillain-Barre should be able to either write a letter or write a note or justify getting the, the vaccine for COVID. And hopefully they can refer to some of the resources that we have on our website, like the statement from the CDC that says it is in fact safe for prior GBS patients to have the vaccine. Um, so I'm curious, you mentioned um, about the flu vaccine. So if someone feels that their Guillain-Barre was triggered by the flu vaccine, that's a very different situation than therefore thinking that you're, um, you would be triggered to have GBS again from the COVID vaccine. That's correct. There's no reason to think that if you truly had Guillain-Barre from the flu vaccine, there's no reason to think that the COVID vaccine would make you more prone to have recurrence of the, of the disease. Okay. 
And when you were mentioning that possibly if you'd had Guillain-Barre in the past, that could move you up on the list potentially um, to receive the vaccine, would the same apply to CIDP and MMN patients? Um, with CIDP patients, I would think so. So if somebody has CIDP active disease, particularly with lung involvement, and when I say lung involvement, I mean diaphragm and intercostal muscles because CIDP actually doesn't cause intrinsic disease of the lung. But if they have problems with shortness of breath, particularly with exertion, uh, I would think that they would be a candidate to move up and get an earlier vaccination, uh, almost regardless of age. Okay. And the same for MMN. Well, I think it would be harder with MMN. With multifocal motor neuropathy, which involves the upper extremities and doesn't involve the diaphragm or intercostal muscles, I think it would be a harder sell um, to ask for an earlier vaccine. Okay. So while we're talking about CIDP and MMN, um, is there a recommended time that one should receive the vaccine in the infusion cycle? Yes, and this is based upon um, an understanding of how IVIG works. And I think most, most of us believe that if you've received the vaccine, you shouldn't have IVIG for at least a week, week and a half. And the other side, if you've received IVIG, you should wait about a week or two for the COVID vaccine. And actually that applies to almost all vaccines. Mm -hmm. COVID or flu or pneumococcal or DPT, that you should, um, and the whole concept is when you get IVIG, you're getting an infusion of antibodies that may block the effectiveness of the vaccine that you're getting. A lot of this is theory and hasn't been proven, and it's probably not likely to be a scientific proof in the long run. Okay, we're, we're discovering as we go, right? We're discovering um, as we go. So for those who feel that they are in um, sort of more recently recovering GBS, um, should they still get the vaccine if offered to them, if they feel that their GBS is, I'll say, somewhat active or um, recent? Yes, they should get the vaccine. What's the reason for that and the rationale? So if you have Guillain-Barre recovering, the last thing you want is a natural infection from COVID. So we are very close to a half a million deaths in the United States from COVID. What you don't want to do, even though the incidence of COVID is going down and that's wonderful, with Guillain-Barre, you just don't want to get an infection mm -hmm. of any type, much less COVID, particularly if you're older. And this is a really rare question, but we have had people reach out to us where, um, they had GBS in the past and then they had active COVID. Do they still need the vaccine as well? Yes, uh, and again, this is not a question that uh, a neurologist usually handles, but uh, in my reading um, and keeping myself informed, if you've had a COVID infection, you still should have a vaccination and that's whether or not you've had Guillain-Barre in the past or CIDP for that matter. Okay, okay. Um, and if I am vaccinated, am I still able to transmit that virus to others? I know this isn't specific to GBS and CIDP, but people are concerned about this. Well, uh, I, this is, that's probably a question far better directed to an infectious disease person. Um, but I think that if you have the active infection, and particularly if you got the vaccination within a few days of developing the infection, you could still pass it on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. 
And if uh, one feels that they had uh, Guillain-Barre as a result of the vaccine, is there some place that they should um, report that? Are you talking about the COVID vaccine? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, so if you think that you developed Guillain-Barre um, as a result of the COVID vaccine, um, you should first of all see your primary care doctor who will probably refer you to a neurologist or, and that neurologist may actually refer you to an academic medical center. The first thing that needs to be proven is, do you really have Guillain-Barre or do you not? And there is a reporting system with the um, CDC called VAERS, which is the vaccine associated um, responses. And then they look into whether this truly was Guillain-Barre or not. Um, and if it is, then it is adjudicated by a group of um, infectious disease doctors, both pediatricians and adults and neurologists. And only if they all agree that it truly was Guillain-Barre is that attributed to the vaccine. Okay. But to date, there's no known research or um, confirmation of, of such cases. Okay. So I looked it up today and I am in constant communication with friends. There has yet to be a single um, report of Guillain-Barre, proven Guillain-Barre developing after the COVID vaccine. That's good news for the Guillain-Barre and CIDP MMN community then. Right. One other thing that I also just learned in a recent um, interaction is, and this is, doesn't even make a lot of common sense, but the incidence of Guillain-Barre in people with COVID is much less than in people after other infections. Can you say that again? <laughs> so if you look at people with infections, let's say the flu or various types of pneumonia versus COVID, the incidence of Guillain-Barre after the natural COVID infection is less than it is for other infections. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. <laughs> and again, good news. Very good news. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, it sounds like in almost all cases with GBS, whether you had GBS in your past, um, in your more recent present, um, the vaccine is, is really gonna be recommended um, to, to most patients and that applies to the CIDP and MMN community as well. That is an emphatic yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the clarity and I know that our patient community will as well. Um, and just want to remind folks that they can uh, refer to our website where we have a statement from the CDC saying that this is safe. Um, we have uh, a statement that Dr. Fauci uh, corrected himself saying that prior GBS patients um, are recommended to have the vaccine. And I believe you were um, a part of the group that suggested that Dr. Fauci retract that statement um, that he'd originally made. Yes, and to his credit, he admitted he was wrong and he corrected it with essentially no prodding on our part. So um, his, uh, his on honesty is impressive. Okay. Well, Dr. D'Onofrio, um, thank you so much for your time today. Are, are there any sort of last bits of wisdom or information that you feel the community should know regarding the vaccines and COVID and GBS and CIDP? Well, Again, emphatically, um, I advocate the use of the COVID vaccine um, for essentially everyone. In fact, I am not even aware of a neurologic condition for which the COVID vaccine would not be recommended. A common question that comes up is if I am immune suppressed, that is I'm on um, let's say I'm a CIDP patient and I'm taking Imuran or Celsept or um, Rituximab and other agents that are used to 
interfere with the immune system because the immune system is part of, of the persistence of the disease that maybe I shouldn't receive the vaccine. That is not true. If you receive the vaccine, it may not be quite as effective because the immune system is uh, pharmacologically impaired. But it's still, even if the immune response is diminished, it's still better than no response at all. And like you said in the beginning of the conversation, these vaccines, the effective rate is so much higher than the vaccines and in other situations that even if it's slightly diminished, you're still way ahead of the game. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that, that not only is it 95% effective, but the one of the marvelous things about medical science is that these vaccines were developed in less than a year. And most vaccines take between five and eight years to develop. So we really should be appreciative to the pharmaceutical industry for so rapidly advancing this vaccine in less than a year. All right. Well, thank you again. And um, I want to remind everybody that Dr. D'Onofrio is at uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, one of our centers of excellence. I believe we have 56 centers around the world. These are the places to go to meet experts like Dr. D'Onofrio who can really help guide you and your questions and specifically um, help sort out any um, more high level questions or complications that you might have. So again, Dr. D'Onofrio, thank you. And to those of you who are watching and listening, um, please join us every month as we bring new programs to you, new experts to you, and let us hear from you um, on your suggestions for future topics. The links to all the information we referenced today will be put um, in the bottom of the program here. So thank you again for listening. Thank you, Dr. D'Onofrio. Have a wonderful day. You're welcome. Thank you.